All right, Roger. Thank you very much for uh, for doing this. This is this is uh, wonderful. We um, I guess we'll introduce you for anyone that doesn't know, but everyone definitely knows who you are if they're listening to us talk. But uh, uh, Roger Veer, you are the CEO of Bitcoin.com. You're like the OG Bitcoin evangelist. Um, uh, I I want to like thank you because like you have so many things on YouTube where I've sent like there's even a video of you what at like a libertarian convention where you like stand up immediately. And you just get really excited about Bitcoin. And, and it's like one of the coolest videos. It's just like an old video camera. Um, so like, thanks for everything that you've done to, you know, to bring Bitcoin to everybody. Um, and uh, I, I, we can just get into it, I guess. Like we have questions we want to ask you, but I, I did want to just like generally broadly ask you um, about your like history. You know, you were at like a libertarian. I can, oh, I can add one. Light thing to the inter- introduction, if you don't mind, and, and and thank you for such a kind introduction there. Uh, and, and you concluded it for you know thank you for for you know trying to bring Bitcoin to everybody. And I, I guess I just want to make it clear that like my goal isn't to bring Bitcoin to everybody. My goal is to bring more economic freedom to the whole world. And I saw Bitcoin as the best tool to possibly you know achieve that. And that's why I was busy promoting Bitcoin since 2011. Not because it was Bitcoin, but because it was this amazing tool to bring more economic freedom to the world. And I, I've watched a number of you guys as you know podcasts. So I suspect you guys are on board with that that goal as well. So definitely, yeah. Um, well, thanks for doing that for sure. Uh, and and I guess I wanted to be curious. I was just curious since we have you. Like you, you, I heard this one time a long time ago that the reason why you left the United States, obviously, you're pretty much targeted by. Uh, someone it was the ATF um, is for selling like firecrackers or something on on your website. Um, is it true? You, you mentioned like you had spoken out about Waco and then there was something yeah. like conspicuous timing in that respect. Can you maybe clarify what, what you think <clears throat> happened there? I, I think a big precipitating factor was uh, I was in a debate with the Republican and Democratic candidates at San Jose State University and at this debate in front of everybody in the audience uh, and this was 1999 or 2000, this would have been 2000. Um, I called the ATF and FBI a bunch of jackbooted thugs and murderers in reference to all the kids, they literally children. I think it was something like over 50 kids less than 12 years of age, they burnt to death inside of this church in, in Waco, Texas. And like, yeah, their parents are religious nuts, but like burning to death all their kids in a church because their parents are religious nuts, that doesn't help anybody at all. So like if you burn to death kids in a church, you're a murderer. And uh, the ATF and FBI really didn't like me saying these sorts of things. And uh, it became really, really clear at uh, what was called a pretrial conference, which was with my attorney, the prosecuting U.S. attorney. And there were two uh, ATF agents there. And uh, I remember my attorney saying, like, hey, these are store-bought firecrackers. We're selling them on eBay. We weren't trying to hide anything. We weren't doing anything clandestine. Like, this, you know, we can, like, pay a fine and do some community service, and, and that can be the end of it. And the ATF and AF agent, he literally pounded his hand on the table and said, but you didn't hear the things that he said in reference to the things that I was saying. So like they were really, really angry about the things that I was saying, not so much about any of the things that I were doing. And as was shown, even by the fact that the, the very firecrackers that I was selling were still being sold even while I was in prison uh, by the manufacturer who didn't have a permit either. So they were breaking the exact same law that I was, um, but eventually they were just basically told to stop selling them and they, they didn't have to you know do any prison time. And I, I don't think they even had to pay a fine. I think they just uh, were told to stop selling them along with the, you know dozens and dozens of other distributors across the country. So it's, it's kind of like uh, if they want you badly enough, they can get you. And you know we're seeing that happening with you know Edward Snowden and and, uh, and Julian Assange and all, all sorts of types like that. If you say things the government doesn't like, they'll come after you. Yeah. Um, and that kind of, I mean, that must have, did that kind of play in when you got out of prison was it just immediately i'm done or yeah, I, was, I, was, I was counting the days until i was allowed to leave the country and the day i was allowed to leave i left and there's no perfect place in the world but uh you know the the bully that's actually bullied you directly is is the one that's much more frightening than other potential bullies around the world so like i'm sure that, you know there's plenty of other governments that are you know treat their citizens probably you know even worse than the u.s but they didn't they didn't bully me yet so uh <laughs> I'd like to be, you know, remove myself from the clutches of the U.S. And uh, here I am, 14 years later. Sure. Um, can you maybe speak about what drew, like, what drew you to Bitcoin specifically? You, you know, you mentioned economic freedom, but um, was there any part of you, uh, you know, for a lot of people, especially in the U.S., that got behind like Ron Paul, right? It was and the Fed, all that kind of stuff. Um, is there an aspect of Bitcoin itself that 
that drew itself to you as like sound money or, or is it really just so my, my background i've been studying economics and, and the origin of money <clears throat> and the way something becomes money is it, it, it's something initially that people are using for something so, and it also has to have other characters it has to be durable easily recognizable transportable um, and a limited supply and so i read all these theories on like the origin of money and how something comes to be used as money in books and the theories they sounded like reasonable and i was pretty convinced by reading the books but then while i was in prison there was a whole actual prison economy and i got to see right before my eyes that the the, the commodities that the books described should be useful as money naturally became usable as money so an example of that is tobacco tobacco is storable right it has a use because people can smoke it uh it's easily transportable it's easily recognizable you can't counterfeit it there's a limited supply people naturally started using tobacco uh postage stamps and then top ramen soups because all of those things they have this use tobacco you can smoke stamps you can mail letters soup you can eat uh and all of those things just naturally became money in the prison so like I got to see firsthand with empirical evidence that the theories I had read about in the books were true in practice. And then when Bitcoin came along, I knew both from the theories I had read about in the books and the empirical evidence I saw in the prison economy, I knew 100% for sure people were going to start using Bitcoin as money. There was absolutely no doubt in my mind at all. And uh, as someone who's a fan of you know improving the entire world and making the world a better place, and you do that through more economic growth, uh, Bitcoin was a tool to help bring more economic growth to the entire world. And if you're excited by, you know, Elon Musk going to, you know, Mars and, you know, self-driving cars and, you know, superhuman intelligences and all this sort of thing, the way to get all those things sooner rather than later is through more economic growth. So we should be doing whatever we can to promote more economic growth around the world. And the best way to achieve more economic growth is through more economic freedom. So Bitcoin was this tool to basically get humans to Mars faster and, and self-driving cars faster and, and better, you know, medical technology so we can all live healthily and happily forever uh, faster. So like all these amazing things get enabled by, by more economic growth and Bitcoin was the, the tool to achieve that. Um, I don't, I don't want to, you know, obviously we only have your volume of time. I mean, this whole four cap in there, there's a clear divide. So obviously for anyone listening, like we are on the SV side, right? You're on the BCH side. Uh, I would like to like have a discussion across, but by no means. I would love to have. Are we that hoping um, maybe we can start like why? Why do you guys prefer SV over over BT, BTC, for example? Why do you like SV more than BTC? Sure. Uh, well, I think I, I think what's unfortunate is we probably will have the similar similar answers right as to why you prefer BCH over BTC, right? Um, but for the most, right. but for the most part, um, uh, you know, with SV, I, see. I want to keep comparing it to BCH, but for just BTC, obviously we both agree, right? The the block size cap that, you know, I thought you put it elegantly when you, uh, which thank you for doing this, when you talked with Samson Mao, uh, you were pretty much the only prominent person to say, this is a production quota. And no one else was even talking about like the simple economic fact of how ridiculous it was to like throttle how much a miner could put inside a block, right? Um, so in, in terms of, of economics, the block size cap is important. Um, I think for me, what I would like to see is uh, I would like to see the Bitcoin white paper and the original Bitcoin protocol tried. Like, I don't think it's ever actually been tried. Um, and if there are flaws in, in that system or that, that protocol or in the economics of it or anything like that, then, then maybe we'll go from there. But I, I prefer instead of like being told there are flaws in it, I'd like to, you know, I'm a scientist, right? I want to, I want to see what happens. And, and if the experiment fails, then, then we know, and we can change it or, or, or do something else. Um, and, and for me, I, I guess, you know, in, in just the recent fork, I, I just, well, I, I wanted one. That was the important thing. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. I wanted one in the end. Um, but I, I didn't see the changes that were being made and some of the politics around rejecting, um, like the, the re-implementation of the op codes that seemed to me like that was done on time, but it seemed like it was kind of politically motivated not to include them. Um, there's a lot of unfortunate, I think, politics that happened for sure. Um, but, but I guess that, sorry, I, I got off topic, but why support over just, BTC is, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. And just to add on top of that, uh, which something of you've mentioned quite a bit before is the fees on BTC. Um, and you know, you talked about Bitcoin being money being used for money. And I think when they introduced fees that were so high that immediately turned it off from money, it, it, no one's going to use that as money. Why would I pay that kind of fee? Um, when I could use the traditional system and pay a lower fee. Um, 
I thought, you know, the whole system of fees, I, that was terrible. And that's why I prefer, you know, the SV side uh, over the BTC side. And, and just, I think we're all on the exact same page on, on everything you said. Like uh, the, the BTC guys literally implemented a production quota on block space and production quotas lead to economically inefficient outcomes. And the part that just made me want to pull my hair out was them cheering about the high fees and saying, high fees are great. Hooray. And it's just driving every single potential user away. So uh, we're on the same page on that front. Uh, could, could love we... to hear why. BSV over BCH at this point. So. Well, can we even maybe um like say on this topic segue right? So I think this was interesting too, because um, again, you also uh, that Samson Mao video was. I, I mean, I'm really glad that that's saved forever, just so we're clear. Um, but you also pointed out how Segwit um was essentially a subsidy as well, yeah. right? Um, and I think what what's really important that I feel like you definitely understand. There's a lot of people that understand this, but there's many more that don't understand this is that Bitcoin primarily is an economic system, right? Um, and when you make a change that affects the economics, that, that, that warrants its own conversation instead of, like the, the conversation instead with SegWit got framed as, no, no, it saves us block space, therefore it's good because we can fit more transactions in a block. But no one sat back to, to, maybe, to me ask, is this okay to, to subsidize some data over another? And if I can add a little bit to this, like poor Jihan got trolled incessantly by the core supporters because Jihan said that SegWit transactions are unfairly cheap. Jihan was exactly right. But the reason he got attacked by the core supporters is because they didn't even understand what he said when he said that. So they're unfairly cheap in the sense that a SegWit transaction takes up more resources, but it has to pay a lower fee than a normal transaction that takes up less resources in the, in, in the blockchain there. So like, it's, it's like if, if, a subsidy of anything, right? It's being subsidized. So when if Coca Cola got a subsidy and Pepsi didn't, Coca Cola would be unfairly cheap. It's not a bad thing that it's cheap. It's a bad thing that it's unfairly cheap due to the subsidy. And that's exactly what's going on with SegWit transactions. Is they're unfairly cheap because of this subsidy in favor of SegWit transactions over regular transactions. And so Jihan, his 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 educational background is in economics and psychology, and like. He's exactly on the economic side of that. The SegWit transactions are unfairly cheap and all these economically ignorant core supporters just berated him to no end saying, oh, now you're complaining that SegWit transactions are, are unfairly cheap. Well, they are. So anyhow, that's the end of my uh, little rant on that because I think these BTC supporters, they don't even understand what he was saying because they don't have the economics background to understand that their subsidies are bad, plain and simple. Subsidies are bad. Did you... Um, I mean, did you ever get a chance to check out what Ryan Charles was saying? I mean, this is probably going to get to the differences about data sig verify being a subsidy on computation. Did you I ever... did. I did. Uh, and I, I gave it a lot of thought and I thought it was an interesting argument. Um, and uh, to some extent, it, it was it was right. On the other extent, uh, it's it's like one grain of sand in in the desert is is kind of the way I looked at it after talking to some other developers as well. So, sure. and then the, the the part that seemed a little bit uh, strange to me also was in regards to the debate for it is that previously, in chain and Craig had been in favor of it and said, yeah, this is great, and then they changed their mind later, and then Ryan was the only one that actually tried to give any semblance of an argument as to why they were changing their mind. If if Craig or in chain did, I, I I missed it and didn't see it with you know, the constant stream of, of data input, but, uh, you know, I like Ryan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think uh, the most unfortunate thing to come out of all this is, uh, uh, I, I do, sorry. The split of the community, I think is the most unfortunate thing. Like Ryan, Ryan was right. He made another video that I'm guessing you guys saw too, talking about like, if you, if the goal is to make world money, money for the world, you want even people you don't like and you think are jerks and, and horrible people to still be using that that same money and uh you know this the split sets, sets things back like the network effect is incredibly important the more people using a particular type of money the more useful that money becomes and and seeing the whole and that's what's so frustrating about the entire block size limit to begin with is that it shattered the crypto coin ecosystem from you know bitcoin having 99 percent market share into I think you know probably somewhere less than fifty percent market share at the moment, and I think it's going to continue to head downward uh, from there as well, as long as they keep that uh, production quota in place for the amount of block space uh, the miners are allowed to produce on on BTC. Do you, do you think this fork became about people more than like? Yeah, 
a lot, a lot of it was uh, about people for, for, I, I guess it depends on the person <laughs> for some people it was definitely about people for other people. It was about tech. And for lots of other people, it was just like, I don't want to deal with the fighting. I'm out of here. I'm going to keep using Bank of America, which is really uh, disappointing as well. Sure. Kind of removing the personalities, I guess, out of it. What um, what was kind of the driving force that made you decide Bitcoin.com support the ABC roadmap over the SV roadmap? Um, I don't trust Craig's technical competence. Um, the part that really, really made me think that you can't trust Craig's technical competence when it comes to Bitcoin was when he didn't even know that a Bitcoin address had a checksum at the end of the address. And like, don't get me wrong, like Craig is an absolute genius. Like he knows all sorts of really interesting things about all sorts of things. Like he knows so many interesting things, but he doesn't know everything about everything. And the fact that he didn't know a Bitcoin address had a checksum at the end of it, that was just stunning so, to me. Can I jump in there? Cause that's, that comes up a lot. Uh, and this is the the thing about Craig, and I, I was, you know, I hate talking about about people generally. People, um, let's, yeah, go for it, but let, and we'll focus on ideas eventually. Well, but. well Craig's a, a not a great communicator about what he's saying, but what seemed clear to me, and we actually did like a whole episode talking about this, was his whole thing about the checksum wasn't about an address doesn't have a checksum. It, my understanding, and it seemed pretty clear if you if you looked at what he was saying, was that. The, the he was criticizing the wormhole protocol for essentially using the checksum system of a wallet, right? Because so, a checksum was added, uh, you know, you don't need a checksum to send to an address, right? The checksum is added no, no, no. for the security. The the address itself has a checksum built in. So like a Bitcoin address is one, you know, X2, blah, 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 blah. And then the last several digits of that address, you can use with a mathematical formula to make sure that all the preceding digits are actually correct. So like lots of things use checksums, including Bitcoin addresses. And so like, that's why like there's, there's an address. I don't know if you've seen it. It's called like one Bitcoin eater address, do not send. And then the last couple of digits are just gibberish. The re and the last couple of digits have to be gibberish because those are the checksum for the rest of that address. And without the checksum, every wallet will recognize that address as being invalid and won't let you send anything to it. So. Right, but his argument was was more about the way the checksum was being used by the protocol. To he he was essentially saying you should make this as hard as possible to send bitcoins to, or make the sending of bitcoins for the burning of the tokens to only be done on this separate layer. And he, he his argument, whether it's a fair argument or not, was, and this is I guess my problem is that like to to argue that he didn't understand it, you could you could make the argument that that's what he's doing. But what he was essentially saying was this should be as hard as possible to send Bitcoins to this since you're never going to get them back ever. They just go to this, this burn address. Um, and, and again, whether you communicate this well is, is questionable, but, um, so it, it was several months since I read everything, but I remember sure. reading it and just it blowing my mind. Like how can, cause Craig is incredibly knowledgeable about Bitcoin. Like he there's, you know, I've been around for about eight years full time in Bitcoin now. And there's not too many people in the world I can sit down with and talk about all the different historical things that happened within Bitcoin and then be able to keep up with that conversation. Craig can keep up and surpass me in that sort of conversation. He knows all the stuff that I do about all the different you know events and things that happened in the early days of Bitcoin and more. Um, but And I remember reading it and it was just, it was very clear that he didn't realize that Bitcoin addresses had a checksum built in. And it was just stunning to me that he wouldn't know that. So like, even to this day, I, I don't know why or how he didn't uh, know that. And uh, Did, but at the end, at the end of the day, though, I think you're right. It, it's about the ideas, uh, not the people. Did, but, did you happen um, to see? Um, we actually did a Q and A with Steve Shatters and Daniel Connolly. I don't know if you got a chance to see that, but no, I've um, watched lots of your episodes, but I haven't seen that one. Because so. uh, I guess that's what was also, I think, frustrating from. Uh, any, uh, you know, supporting that rule set from the bat, but again, supporting more so we didn't want to split was the thing that I was, I was really hoping would happen. Um, but what, maybe what that's another example of, of Craig being incompetent on that front because he was out there saying there absolutely will not be a split. There's no way there's going to be a split and it's okay to be wrong, but, uh, he was pretty clearly wrong on that one. So sure. Um, yeah, I, I think the. The outcome of a split is very, very unfortunate. And uh, I was hoping that, that he was going to be right about there being no split for sure. Um, 
I, I was hoping he would be right as well. I I didn't think he was going to be, um, but I was hoping he would be. So. I, I guess you, you said the technical incompetency of, of Craig is what made you prefer the ABC rule set over the SV rule set. And I, I guess what, what was was frustrating, at least to me, was like we spent through a lot of time. We, we wanted to get Steve and, and Daniel, which I know like you're at the Bangkok meeting, right? So I'm sure. Some and I, I, I like I like a lot of these guys. Like I know Steve. Steve is a nice guy, not really sharp, smart, nice guy. Like uh, I guess that was what was so frustrating for me about the split is that the the differences of opinion were so small and insignificant in the grand scheme of things that it didn't seem worth splitting over uh, at all. But here we are. So. Um, but but could you could you maybe see an argument that adding like a new op code, for example, for for a team committed to getting back to the original Bitcoin and trying it, right? Could you see how maybe the addition of a new op code that maybe does subsidize computation or that maybe does, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, Craig's argument was based in the law, and that's a whole separate thing, right? Um, sorry, that's my. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, Is that a fire alarm or? It's an oven. Let me make sure. All right, it's gonna stop. Uh, it's but uh, of a fire alarm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it might right. Sure, yeah, all right. <laughs> um, but but I guess like, could you see why maybe the addition of new things would be a game, like a deal breaker, right? Um, and obviously yeah. it was right. Um, yeah. Do you? Do I, you I, I, I can see that. Sure. Do you think that, like, do you think there's a divide in maximalism versus non-maximalism? Um, between the two or three camps, I guess the three Bitcoins that exist. So I, I guess we need, to, you want to define what maximalism means in this particular instance? Well, I guess there's, there seems to be at least like in this, for whatever reason, it's become a hot topic in the past couple of weeks of just like, there are uh, people that think there will be just one cryptocurrency and that will be Bitcoin. Uh, I'm going to have to turn that off. I'm really sorry. Corey, you can, uh, yeah. <laughs> sorry. I think I know Fire what the question is going to be, uh, but basically there's going to be one Bitcoin in the end, which um, that's kind of the maximalist theory. And then there's the other side of things that thinks that we'll be able to transport, you know, goods and services with multiple different cryptocurrencies. Um, and I guess which, so I, we think that that was kind of the lead up for the split in a way. I think Bitcoin had a really, really, really good shot. The BTC version, the old version, which is now much more closely aligned with, you know, both BCH and BSV. I think that had a really, really good shot at having the vast majority of market share for the world. And then by imposing that production quota on the amount of block space, they destroyed that first mover advantage and shot at that happening. Um, so I don't know. I've, I've never been a Bitcoin maximalist for the reason that it's Bitcoin. I was a Bitcoin, a bit of a Bitcoin op. I guess I was a Bitcoin optimist because I thought it had the best characteristics that give it the best shot at really getting a lot of market share and adoption and traction around the world. And with that production quota on block space, my optimism for the future of, of BTC has faded. And now, uh, and for a long time, you know, you know, any smart investor, you don't put all your eggs in one basket. I've held a bunch of different cryptocurrencies for a long, long time. You know, I have a couple dozen at this point, probably. Um, but I'm I'm a Bitcoin cash optimist um, because I see it as having a really, really good shot at getting more traction and more merchants and more adoption. You know, you have the blockchain.infos, the Coinbase's, the BitPay's, the, you know, maybe ballpark figure three quarters of the, of the original super passionate user base went with the BCH side versus the SV side. Does that sound like about right you know three quarters versus one quarter somewhere somewhere in that ballpark right two thirds one third some, somewhere in there um but uh at the end of the day like if it's bsv that's fine if it's bch that's fine even if it's btc it's fine it's whatever actually empowers the individual to have more control over their own their own money and brings more economic freedom to the world that's the tool that i'm the most excited about and that i'm going to promote and like I said in my debate with Samsung, they've literally delayed the progress of the entire human species uh, with their stupid, you know, production quota and, uh, you know, hindrance of, of Bitcoin adoption. So that's the, I guess that's the thing that's the most frustrating of the, the BCH, BSV split now is that it's another delay. So, I mean, I think what, 
what interests me the most is is when you get into like if if we're building sound money if the goal here is to um replace fiat currency right uh then the underlying system like the underlying economics of of okay well, what makes this sound money is important right um so like one argument you could make uh about ethereum moving to proof of stake would be uh it essentially you know it allows people to just buy their way into the system and then get richer and, and it's kind of like uh to borrow it, it to me it feels like a very socialist type system where you kind of have people being able to buy influence in the system and then if you buy influence you can gain more influence it reminds me a lot of of the failures of, of a lot of structures that we have today um and with bitcoin the reason why i i draw i'm drawn to bitcoin right it does introduce a lot of economic freedom but if you look at the debasement of of bitcoin is very hard because of the competitive nature of of the system right um the uh, one because of the competing cryptocurrencies or, or because of the, the system itself with the mining and yeah and the that. competitiveness of, of the mining right oh. um and, and i think what i'm interested in oh, hearing both your... of those things, i guess huh sorry uh, oh. or, or actually both of those things because people switch to something that's sounder if, if bitcoin becomes less sound so yeah i guess multiple layers of defense for for bitcoin be, being sound money but sure. I, I didn't mean to interrupt no 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 yeah, yeah um i think that's fair uh what I found interesting leading up to, and this still, when I have, I try not to generalize, like there's definitely no generalization of one SV side or one BCH side, but I've had, I've tried to have conversations like across the aisle, just generally. And, and one of the things that comes up is this idea of minor centralization, right? And this has been a, this has been a concern for a long time in Bitcoin's history, right? That um, the argument on the BTC side was that essentially you'll end up having is, uh, you know, a few miners that control the system. And then they argue that, uh, th that's terrible because then they can just set the rules and then we're back to fiat system. Um, now, now, the reason I'm asking this question is what, what seems to me to be also a, a very pertinent, like ideological split <clears throat> is that there seems to be a group, there seems to be a commitment to prevent one miner from out competing other groups of, of, of miners and, in in if I can maybe clarify that, one of the arguments for CTOR, for example, is that it makes the propagation of of, uh, of blocks or transactions or just generally just makes propagation easier for everyone running the software, right? right. Um, my question to you, and, and this is the argument that I've made, is to me, minor centralization is, is the same in, in economic terms. It's like arguing that monopolies exist in a free market, where if um, if we were to never touch the protocol, the, the Bitcoin protocol, I don't think you would ever actually end up with uh, minor centralization unless you change the protocol to favor one miner over another or, or something like that. Where in the uh, in the case of like, I, I would argue monopolies don't exist without the, um, you know, with the, with the help of, of regulations or um, any other kind of state actor, right? Um, do Do you think that this idea of minor centralization is something to be concerned about? Do you think um so so if i can jump in so occasionally even in the free market you will have natural monopolies where it's just more economically efficient to have one particular you know provider of what one particular service in a particular area um whether or not that would be the case of bitcoin mining probably not but uh natural monopolies can and, and do exist uh sometimes the bad but but those aren't a problem the bad monopolies are the government granted uh you know, monopolies, those, those are the horrible ones that, that cause economic inefficiencies. Do, do you think, so I guess just generally, do you think that there is a concern, um, is there a concern of minor centralization today in, in Bitcoin? And people, people are concerned about it. So from that, you know, outside looking in, yeah, people are concerned about it. How concerned am I about it? Not all that much. Um, I mean, BSV, I think Calvin and his group probably have more than 51% of the hash rate, but that hasn't been a problem thus far. Um, and I think that's another thing a lot of people don't really appreciate is the miners are the ones that are the most incentivized to protect and support the system because they have all this, you know, capital goods, like the mining equipment and the warehouses and the contracts with the power companies and this and that. They have all this money tied up to support that network so of course they want it to succeed 
And so I see a lot of these people in, in you know, both Ethereum and BTC attacking the miners and thinking that the miners are, you know, bad people attacking the network. No, the miners are the ones with the most incentive to defend the network and make it useful to the world, because if they don't, they're destroying their, their own capital. Yeah, that's very well said. Um, do, do you think, and maybe I'm asking this as a, um, the, the other big thing that came up was this, this uh, word permissionless, right? So permissionless came up as kind of a, the ideological fork, I guess. It, it, it was kind of used against the SV side that Bitcoin is permissionless peer-to-peer -peer cash and therefore I don't support uh, BSV. Could you maybe talk about like, like what is permissionlessness and, and um, why do you, do, you, do you think that there is a concern about permissionlessness on SV? I, I don't know if I, I noticed that sort of mantra or that sort of thing being said about SV. The the, the thing that I did notice the most is is even before the SV BCH split, Craig talking about patents and he's going to sue this and sue that and use patents, 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 and uh, even before you know BSV was even even a, a consideration, myself and others were speaking out against those patents, and uh, I think that's one of the biggest ideological frustrations or differences between uh, you know Craig and Inchain. And the rest of the BCH camp is, you know, they're busy suing a bunch of open source software developers and they're talking about how they're going to use their patents against other coins. I'm not on board with that philosophically uh, at all. And uh, I'm guessing you guys probably aren't either, to be honest. So yeah, but I think well, the first thing is that they're not suing anybody. There is a group of people suing, allegedly suing you, allegedly, right? Uh, other open yeah, source. I, I've exchanged a number of emails with Calvin, like, he supports the lawsuit very, very clearly, uh, and, and said he's you know busy promoting the lawsuit every chance he gets on his media outlet. So like, uh, and I'm pretty darn sure that he's the one funding the lawsuit to to be ha uh, made. Um, yeah, there's a shell company in between them, so the lawsuit isn't Calvin Air versus open source software developers. It's some company that nobody's ever even heard of. That's just some shell company that was just bought recently, is uh, you know doing the suing, but. Uh, he, even if it wasn't related to him at all, which I do think it is related to him, he's out there cheerleading for it every step of the way, and, and so is Craig. Uh, philosophically, I'm I'm not on board with that uh, at all, and uh, it sounds like you by you guys trying to separate Calvin from the lawsuit, it sounds like what you're trying to say is that you don't support the lawsuit either. I, that, I, uh, I think it's very unproductive, and no, I, I don't think it's it's um, a good look. I don't think it's it's worth anyone's time to do that, any of that. No. Um, I my guess con I my concern though with the patents though is I guess how do you feel though if someone else came along and did the patents as well? Anybody, because I guess there's always going to be a threat of that. We were talking about bad monopolies. Uh, patents are an example of a horrible government granted monopoly. Uh, so like patents are bad across the board. Period. Like patents are bad. Sure. In fact, like you hear a lot of excitement, especially from the BTC camp, but some from BCH and others now about, you know, implementing Schnorr signatures. The main reason probably why Schnorr signatures weren't used from day one in Bitcoin is because they were patented. And the the, the patent just expired recently after the creation of Bitcoin. So like uh, another example of how patents have delayed the, you know, progression of the entire human species. Uh, they do it time and time again. Patents are bad and they retard the rate of economic growth of the entire world. Uh, and so Craig out there saying he has a bunch of patents and he's going to not let anybody use different things like congratulations, Craig, you're advocating for retarding the rate of economic growth of the entire world and holding back the human species. So, uh, congratulations for promoting the wrong thing. Yeah, I think, I think the patent discussion is something that, um, I, I think it's a great debate. Actually, I, I, uh, I actually respect, I respect that viewpoint patents wholeheartedly. And I will, if, if the Bitcoin protocol is ever attacked with patents, I'll be very, I'll be completely against that, right? Um, I, I think the whole- What well, is right now, Craig and Inchain are saying they have a bunch of patents and they're not gonna let other competing cryptocurrencies use any of the things that they patented. That's an attack on the progress of the entire human species because we're seeing this Darwinian evolution of cryptocurrencies and you know you have Zcash and Monero and Ethereum and this and that. Like at the end of the day, the most useful cryptocurrencies should wind up being used by the most number of people not the cryptocurrency that has the most number of patents protecting it. And the in-chain group are trying to have their cryptocurrency have the most number of patents protecting it so that the other cryptocurrencies aren't able to, to compete with that because of these patents. Like that's bad for everybody. Sure, but, but I don't think, 
I mean, I, I don't think the existence of, well, I agree with you that it's good that, you know, cryptocurrencies have to compete to have like the better product. I don't necessarily think it's a good thing that we have thousands of cryptocurrencies that are um, traded on exchanges that God knows how many of them are actually solvent. Um, to me, it seems like we're just replacing, if we do end up with this world of even just 30 cryptocurrencies and, um, well, we already have a world with thousands of cryptocurrencies, right? Like that wasn't true a couple of years ago, but, but when the you know the production quota got imposed on BTC, boom, we had this explosion of other competing cryptocurrencies. So. But, but I'd argue it pretty much introduced inflation into this entire economy, where essentially we had, uh, I mean, the case of the run up of BTC to 20 grand, you could argue, you know, there's 8,000 conspiracy theories as to why that happened, but Tether seems to be a, a big piece of that, which... God knows how solvent Tether is, which then you had exchanges, um, you know, lending out uh, or, or who knows how solvent the exchanges are. And then who knows what the actual price of the Bitcoin is. I, I think this uh, burst of, of what the economy was and probably the run up of it, too, is a manipulated, inflated type system that I don't think is actually brings sound money to anybody. Right. So we can talk about how like the ability to transact peer to peer um and, and have that settle into a blockchain that's a great thing of course that's that's a wonderful thing but have the assets themselves not really be sound that's kind of what, I, what bothers me right yeah i think we got way off base from from the patent issue there though too sure. oh, like yeah. uh yeah. sure can, can we all say that we agree that like the patents are bad and in chain trying to impose their patents on other crypto coins are, are bad and they shouldn't be doing that and craig is wrong for advocating that sort of thing uh, well, I, I'm conflicted on intellectual property. Actually, I, I um, like I, I have a, I have a problem with the other flip side of like, like, do you think that artists own their songs? Do you think that like people? Yeah, so should... I, I think that the patents are an illegitimate government granted monopoly, and copyright, even though it's not often respected properly, copyright. Let's say I I write a book and I give it to you, like you can bundle rights so and saying, here's a copy of my book, but in selling it to you you're promising me that you're not going to make copies of that book and then give it to other people. And so the, I think copyrights are fine in that perspective. And I think it's the, the copyright issuer is the one who's responsible for enforcing that copyright, not, not the state. Uh, and patents are just plain illegitimate government granted monopoly. So Murray Rothbard has a, a really great uh, explanation of the difference between patents and copyrights. And I remember reading that as a young, young man and uh, finding it very convincing. So, uh, you know, here's another example of how Murray Rothbard has influenced my uh, view of the world. And I don't know if you guys have read any Rothbard yourself, but uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. And uh, another example of uh, the world being a better place because we have these you know, super geniuses that can help push all of humankind's understanding forward. Sure. Yeah. I, I, I totally respect your opinion on patents. I think it's legitimate. I think um, I'm conflicted on it myself. I've, I've thought about it a lot. Um, now, state, I agree with you, a better outcome would be to not be a state system, right? That That's undeniable that that you're going to have corruption, you're going to have um, bad enforcement of that, no matter what. But intellectual property, I think, is is something that like I don't I don't uh, we can maybe stay away from an intellectual property debate because um, I, I want to. This is the reason why you're talking about permissionless or uh, patents. I asked about like permissionless. Is Bitcoin permissionless? Because this is something that comes up so much. It came up with John Fuqual. That was his main criticism of. Um, he wrote it 800 times when you specifically came out with your video talking about. Uh, kind of your decision, you brought up the word permissionless a lot. You said Bitcoin is permissionless peer-to-peer -peer cash. And, and what does that mean? It means that you can send and receive money with anyone anywhere without needing permission from, from anyone. That's that's how I see it. Okay. Because uh, I guess what bothers... I think a lot of cryptocurrencies meet that, that definition uh, at the moment. And uh, BTC, it has maybe a, a big number of exchanges and merchants, but when the fees are $50 each to make them, that... that uh, prices a lot of people out of the, the market to be able to use it so sure um maybe i'm taking this too literally but what i guess what bothers me about the idea that bitcoin is permissionless in transacting is that doesn't that inherently mean that miners have to include every transaction like like doesn't that mean that if i make a transaction it must be included in the blockchain if bitcoin is permissionless mm. I think the miners get to choose which transactions they want to include in, in the blocks. And we've seen that in action on BTC where the, the people that pay the most get the included in the, in the blocks and the people that paid less don't. So, uh, 
yeah, I think the miners decide, right? The miners are the ones that are producing the block space. They get to decide what they put in it. Sure. And, and I guess I get important to get because it, it seems I, more that Bitcoin incentivizes censorship resistance, right? There's an incentive to include transactions in blocks, but it's not necessarily a permissionless way to transact, right? Because it, it still almost by definition requires the permission of a miner, right? Yeah, I, I understand the, the distinction you're making. I, I think you're right. Sure. Okay. Um, uh, that we are quite over time. I want to respect your time. I'm, I'm okay if you guys okay. are. Yeah. Okay. Um, Perfect. Yeah, and I know. I think you said the hour, so we'll, we'll respect that. Um, but but I guess I just want to maybe ask the general question of, of where do you – you had that chart, which was great. When you were searching on that cruise – uh, <laughs> was it the cruise where you, you gave the presentation? I think Charlie had nothing to respond to it. You talked about, um, you, you kind of compared BCH and, and BTC, uh, and, and what was more Bitcoin, right? Um, now that we have three Bitcoins, I guess, where, where in your chart do, do the three lie? Like, like what is your, your general opinion on, on, um, obviously there, there's probably some internal bad blood with sv just generally right there's not to be honest so like uh, i wish the sv camp like the absolute best of luck in creating whatever it is that they want to create uh and i hope it's something that's useful to me too so uh i don't have any bad blood towards towards sv at all i, I wish them uh i wish them good luck i don't have any bad blood towards btc as a currency at all either i have a lot of bad blood towards the people in the BTC camp that imposed the censorship and the propaganda and booted everybody out of, you know, BitcoinTalk.org and our Bitcoin and literally like shattered the entire crypto coin ecosystem. I have a lot of bad, bad blood to the people that did that through lies and deceit and propaganda and censorship. But uh, for the currency itself, I don't have any bad blood for, for you know, BTC, BSV or, or any of the other altcoins out there. How do you think that they can... And so for, for, I'm sorry, your question about the chart... Um, I've been meaning to go and update it uh, and and take a look, right? Because a lot of times you don't know until you do it. I, I suspect uh, I suspect BCH and BSV will have pretty much all the exact same boxes checked, and I think both of them will have more Bitcoin ness about them than BTC, uh, and I think they'll they'll be about about the same footing there. This is what uh, I suspect, and maybe I'll try and do that this week and, and make another update video for for people about that, but. Uh, uh, I, have, I haven't made the time to do that yet, but I, I suspect that they're pretty similar. Any, any thoughts yourself on that? Or I, I think they're almost the same is kind of how I see it. They're, I think they're pretty much pretty similar. Yeah, yeah. especially, I, I think with your definitions, they're probably gonna probably check the same boxes, right? Um, maybe the, the general question I, I wanna ask you is about the white paper. Like uh, I, there's a lot of criticism about following the white paper to a T um, like, like I would actually argue that I think the white paper, uh, now whether this actually, this didn't really play out the way I was hoping it would, but the white paper to me describes, uh, one chain of, of, uh, being determined by Nakamoto consensus. Right. Um, and, and yeah. I, I understand the argument of like, especially in this past fork, Bitcoin.com brought in a lot of hash rate. You guys pretty much built the longest chain off the bat. Right. So if we had to give a strict definition of, of short term. Nakamoto consensus in that first week, you guys won the Nakamoto consensus battle. Um, now there's still no replay protection, so you could argue it's still going on. I can but... clarify a little bit more on that. There's like both BSV and BCH, we've already lost the longest chain with the most proof of work battle. Uh, BTC has that. Yep. Um, but as I argued in my other video, if you're not a peer to peer electronic cash system, which BTC is not, and they're not trying to be, you're not Bitcoin, and that's the very title of the white paper. If you're not trying to be what's in the very title of the white paper, you're certainly not Bitcoin. So, do you think the governance model of, I guess, how do you view the white paper? Is it is it like a? I call it a constitution. I think it it probably makes sense to call it similar to the the U.S.'s constitution. It seems to me like it lays the ground rules and and the in Bitcoin the economic protocol. Um, like like how do you view its role? In Bitcoin's future, is it infallible? Is it uh... certainly not infallible? But uh, I guess I'm a bigger fan of empirical evidence, and we saw with BTC for its first, you know, seven or eight years there, it had the, both the software code and the economic code that made it growing year after year into this worldwide phenomenon. And then it just still boggles my mind. We have all these, you know, Bitcoin core supporters claiming that they're taking the conservative path. 
and being you know super conservative and stable and reliable by taking something and making it the very first cryptocurrency in the entire world to have full blocks and the very first cryptocurrency in the entire world to have high fees and the very first cryptocurrency in the entire world to have you know slow unreliable reversible transactions like that's the exact opposite of conservatism yet they're up there on you know speeches and youtube videos saying that we're the you know conservative ones protecting what bitcoin is like they did the exact opposite they did the most destructive reckless thing you could possibly do with Bitcoin uh, while saying that they're doing the exact opposite. And there's an example of some Orwellian double speak for you. So in regards to the white paper itself, uh, I think it's a really, really good starting point. And uh, the economic, I'm sorry, the empirical evidence showing that it worked was was fantastic. So we have, you know, seven or eight years of that uh, on the BTC chain, we can see what worked. And it was fast, cheap, reliable transactions. Uh, I think that was probably the biggest disaster that came out of the split between BCH and BSV is, is the FUD that scared so many businesses away into turning off their BCH transactions. So like, you know, BitPay and Coinbase and blockchain.info, so many of these companies completely paused all their Bitcoin cash transactions and it still hasn't recovered to this very day. And it wasn't because the network wasn't working. It was just because they were scared that the network might not work. Whereas with Bitcoin.com, we kept all of our services online the entire way through and didn't have, you know, we didn't miss a beat. We had absolutely zero downtime with any of our services at all. Whereas other, you know, I think other businesses, they still haven't turned it back on. And and that's, that's probably been the most frustrating, disastrous thing. And I guess for a little bit sidetracked from the white paper there, but uh, the short answer is I like the white paper, but it's not infallible. Like uh, it's, uh, <clears throat> but it's good. Do you think there's any um, credence, I guess, to the argument that we should have the block size bigger than um, kind of like a chicken and egg problem where you won't have serious business come in until the block size is, is big enough to handle um, their business? Like that seems to be, um, you know, I don't know if about in May, but it doesn't seem like there's still a plan on the BCH chain to raise the, the block size past 32 in May. As of right now, it might change. I'm not sure. Um, but I mean, that seems to be also be kind of the split in, in, in the difference is like we should bump the block size up and keep going up and up and up so that uh, we can encourage businesses to come on and build on chain, right? Um, and we saw on SV, uh, you know, we, we've seen bigger and bigger blocks produced in some test net fashion or not test net, but testing, testing, testing yeah. fashion. Yeah. Um, I mean, do you buy that? I know that was kind of end chains argument and, and especially the SV developers arguments when we talked to them was like, we should be increasing this now rapidly um, because precisely because any serious business won't build on a chain that, that even is 32 megs, right? Yeah, I, I like that argument. So um, no problem with that argument at all. Uh, I think the big difference is the BTC camp are saying we are not going to increase the block size. Both the, the BCH and the BSV camps are saying we are going to increase the block size. That's 100% you know, philosophically committed to that. And so I, I don't see that these big businesses are going to have a fear that if they come onto the BCH chain, because they didn't increase the maximum block size to 128 megabytes already, uh, they're not going to in the future. And there's very, very strong like social commitment from ABC to scale the blocks to be as big as they need to be someday, uh, just like there is from the BSV camp. And I don't see... Uh, I don't see much of a business difference on on that from potential clients of uh, or potential purchasers of block space on on either chain. Do you, do you view the race? Do you view like the argument that it really is like an urgent race to twenty twenty to June twenty twenty, um, or the next having? Yeah, the having. Um, yeah, I've 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 lived through two havings already, and like they they were both non events, and I think the next one will be a non event as well. Okay, um, I think we are hitting your. Let me hear. Uh, we. I, I, I'm. I'm okay if you guys have a couple other things. If if not, we can wrap it up. Either way is fine with me. Like. Sure. Um, I, I think I I've gotten through my list here, but I mean I, I think just generally I, I, what I like to say at least is like you know Bitcoin.com, um, that helped Corey and and I helped one thing in New York. You guys set up a meetup, so like we are thankful for Bitcoin.com. You guys created so many tools. Um, but, you know again. I cannot say how much I regret that we kind of have this split now. Um, and I would like to just personally thank well, you. Like, if, for... I can, if I can elaborate on that a little bit though too, like I don't think there needs to be a split. You can like both BCH and BSV 
and you can like Ethereum and Dash and Monero and take your pick. And you can, you don't have to be married to one coin. Uh, I think you can be more optimistic about one coin than another, but just because you're more optimistic about one coin doesn't mean you have to hate the others. But I do think we should hate all the censors over and beat the BTC network that don't allow free speech. We should hate anybody that's uh, not allowing free speech. Well, and I don't necessarily disagree with that, but I mean, I mean, for me, like, I want, I want sound money as governed by the white paper is what I want. And, and what bothers me is like, even what, what bothered me the most was when I was on the stream and Andreas Brecken came on and, and said, like, he starts gloating about how they're rolling checkpoints or implemented with, with no one's knowledge with exchanges to pretty much guarantee that there would be a split. And to me, like that, that is the same kind of stuff that I just don't, if I want to build a new monetary system of sound money, like, like to me, I don't support a Bitcoin that, that doesn't govern itself by the white paper, I guess. And, 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 and I understand, like, I, I, I accept your viewpoint that there, there, we can all coexist and live, but, but I do just want one Bitcoin governed by the white paper. I think that will bring the most. Can I ask you a question on that front? So sure. you're saying you want sound money, uh, as defined in the white paper. So is, is sound money sound money because it's sound money or because it follows the white paper what makes it sound money so i think the consensus mechanism in the white paper which is miners that have to compete with each other that never get their hands held that are constantly competing um you, you know because the problem is it's hard to even say it but like i've learned so much from craig about but I think Bitcoin mining, I think the red queen um, hypothesis, uh, I never even heard of that. Anyone mentioned that Bitcoin is a red queen's game. And I looked into that and, and that is a, a perfect display of what Bitcoin mining is, where um, one single entity cannot stand still. They have to continually run and compete with the other entities involved, right? And, and so Bitcoin is sound money because it's, uh, it's hard, it's 21 million, uh, uh, has a supply cap. Right, changing that supply cap at scale, especially the more you scale, the harder it is to change these things that we all hold so dear about Bitcoin. Um, and, and, and so for me, the competitive nature of the system and, and, and miners competing to include your transactions, uh, all, of, all of what is described as how we govern Bitcoin to me produces a sound economic system. And, and, and so that's why like the ability to transact is important, of course, but I can transact just as easily on, on Ethereum as I can on Bitcoin, but the underlying actual, like, like why is my asset valuable to me is completely different between those two, right? Um, and, and while right now that, that may be minimal when it comes to BCH and BSV, um, I, I'd actually argue that there's a, it's maybe not minimal, but, but in, in some cases, those things are important in, in my opinion. And once you, once you don't stick to that one time, then it's a slippery slope for, for the rest of of the eternity, hopefully, if, if Bitcoin does work out, right? Um, but maybe not, maybe not. <laughs> Eventually encryption might fail, so who knows what will happen then. But uh, I, I don't know. I think that's what's important to me, and that's what really kind of bothers me about this. And, and I respect people that, that think this way, but it really does bother me that people argue like all cryptocurrencies should be united. And, and like, like I, I don't... I have serious problems with the way that Ethereum's economics are handled. They're now talking about going to kick off miners from the system. That's right? started. Uh, yeah. And, and, and so it's, uh, the miners are the ones that are the most incentivized to support uh, the system to like, you know, to, to try and get rid of all your ASIC miners. It's a disaster. Uh, yeah. We'll, we'll see how that works out for them. I'm not sure, but uh, um, yeah. So I, I don't know. The ability to transact of course is important and, and I appreciate cryptocurrencies themselves allow people to do that. But um, it, to me, what, what makes the asset valuable, what makes Bitcoin valuable is the, the economic system laid out in the white paper, which I would argue that that's why Bitcoin succeeded, right? That's why Bitcoin succeeded. Yeah, economic other, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, but I don't know. I, there's a split, Maybe like you said, right? So. To, to wrap up, it's the economic code is what made Bitcoin successful and don't, uh, don't underestimate the importance of changing the economic code. If you change the economic code, you're just as likely to, you know, have everything come breaking down as, as if you were to change the software code. And the software code might happen in an instant, whereas changing the economic code will be more gradual. But 
both are incredibly important. So. Yeah. Well, Roger, thank you. Uh, like seriously, thanks for, for doing this. It's um, enjoyable to, to talk to you. Um, and and yes. we, we have to say thank you. Like seriously, uh, Bitcoin.com has done so much, um, not just for ourselves, but um, obviously it sent so many people to get free Bitcoin on, on your faucet and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I definitely... don't be a stranger. Like you're, you're more than allowed to use both BSV and, and BCH and I still own some BSV as well. So um, don't, don't be a stranger. So any, anything that brings more economic freedom to the world, we should be a fan of. So. Sure. Absolutely. Well, 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 thank you again very much for, uh, for this, but also everything you've done for Bitcoin, for sure. So My pleasure. thank you guys both very much. Thank so. you. Thanks. Thanks.